I'm Benedict Ashley. I'm a member of the Dominican Order, the Order of Preachers. I teach at Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis, Missouri. And this is a lecture course on the Bible as the foundation of our moral life and of the church's teaching of moral theology. According to the great medieval theologians who were deeply immersed in the scriptures, there are seven pillars of the Christian life. The first three are faith, hope, and charity. And they are mentioned in the scriptures many times, but especially in the 13th chapter of the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. The other four are less important, but nevertheless essential to the Christian life. They're not listed as four anywhere in the scriptures except in one verse that is to be found in the Book of Wisdom. They are prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. But although they are only mentioned in one verse, and that verse is derived undoubtedly from the Greek philosophers. Nevertheless, although not listed as four, they are mentioned many places in the Old and New Testament. And I like to think of a certain correlation between these first three virtues, faith, hope, and charity, the theological virtues, and the other four the moral virtues, prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. And the correlation goes this way, and I've explained part of it before in the previous lectures. First of all, in the scriptures, a word that corresponds to faith is the word wisdom. Through the Old Testament particularly, wisdom is often mentioned and personified as a beautiful and wise mother, a woman. I think that wisdom is the virtue of prudence, and it is closely related to faith. It brings out, as it were, the more practical character of faith. Faith is primarily about how God reveals himself to us. Prudence has more to do with our decisions in taking our path back to God in the way that he has laid out. With the virtue of hope go the two cardinal virtues of temperance and fortitude. And I explained in the last lecture that the reason for that correlation is because we Christians live in a state of tension, a tension between heaven and earth. On the one hand, we look forward to the kingdom of heaven and its fulfillment in, in heaven, the kingdom of God, as it is, will be fulfilled in heaven. And yet we pray in the Lord's Prayer for the kingdom of God to come here on earth. And so we live between heaven and earth. We have responsibilities to our earthly life, and yet we know that something much more important lies ahead of us. And that's why we need especially the virtue of temperance or moderation, which teaches us to put aside those things that are less important and to seek out the things that are more important. Put a, to put aside many of the pleasures of this life in order to, to move forward and to be free to move forward to eternal life. And so temperance controls our desires for the pleasures of this world. It doesn't say we don't have any pleasure, of course not, we're human, but it moderates and controls those pleasures so they don't get in our way to moving toward God. Fortitude, on the other hand, is the virtue we need to be able to put up with the difficulties of life. To know how to put up a good fight. St. Paul says we must put on the armor of justice and fight in this life against evil. But also to endure 
as Jesus endured on the cross. That requires fortitude or courage. So those two things go with hope, because if we did not hope for a future life, we would not be able, and if we didn't have strong hope for the future life, we wouldn't have the temperance and moderation to give up many good things in this life for the future life. We would not have the courage to endure the sufferings and the troubles and to carry on the, the fight necessary to attain our goal. So then we have a correlation, faith and prudence, hope with temperance and fortitude. And now we come to the third of, the, of these most important virtues that are called the theological virtues because they relate us directly to God. And that third virtue is love. St. Paul tells us that love is the greatest of all the virtues. And he, in saying that, he is only repeating the words of our Lord, who said that the great commandment is the love of God and neighbor that sums up everything else that God asks of us. And so love is the greatest of the virtues. It is what unites us directly to God, brings union between us and God, a union which is like the union between the Father and the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, love is the expression in us, the transformation in us, that the Holy Spirit, who is the love of God, the love in the Trinity itself, that it's that Holy Spirit that gives us love, inspires it, and keeps it alive and growing. In the Old Testament, we don't hear that same emphasis on love. And yet, it is there in the Old Testament. Let me just read you this passage from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them into your children. Speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. And furthermore, as our Lord himself points out, the Old Testament teaches the love of, God, of neighbor as well as of God. In the book of Leviticus in the 19th chapter, the 17th to the 18th verses, we read this. You shall not bear hatred for your brother in your heart. Though you may have to reprove your fellow man, do not incur sin because of him. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against your fellow countrymen. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So the Old Testament does teach the love of God and neighbor. But as you probably noticed from that last quotation, there's a certain restriction, a certain incompleteness in the way that the Old Testament teaches that love of God and neighbor. In the text I just read, it says, love your countrymen. At that time, the Jews still were so concerned about their own survival that they didn't think about people who were not Jewish who were not part of their nation. And the command that God gives them because he understands the human heart and he knows just about how much we can take, God there commanded them to love their countrymen. But he does not go on to say, love every human being in the world, as the New Testament does. It's implied, perhaps. We can't say that God says, love your neighbor and hate your, the foreigners. No, it doesn't say that. But it does not bring out clearly that our love must be universal and extend to all human beings, good and bad. We see then that a certain restriction in the Old Testament conception. The people were not yet ready for the fullness of God's command of love. 
They didn't yet appreciate fully that God is a God of love for all of his creatures. They saw it in somewhat narrower terms. And yet, the love which they're talking about is not just an abstract thing. It's very personal. If you read the Psalms, for example, which are the great poems and hymns of the, of the Scripture, in those Psalms, the psalmist, King David, and the other people who wrote after him, speak to God face to face, heart to heart. D David is not afraid to tell God of his doubts, his troubles, his feelings of rebellion, his sinfulness, because he knows God loves him. And he expresses his love for God over and over and over. He praises God. He rejoices in God's work. He's on God's side. He fights for God. This is a very personal kind of love that we find in the scriptures. And those of you who are acquainted with Jews who are religious know perfectly well that they have a great piety. To this day, they continue to have this profound sense that God is concerned about them, that they have a covenant with God, that God will see that they survive in spite of all the sufferings that they have gone through. And they love God earnestly. They want to carry out in their daily life every command of God to the letter. This is Jewish piety, and it is a very deep piety, and we find it throughout the Old Testament. I think sometimes our Christian piety is too impersonal, too abstract. We talk about loving God, but we don't seem to see God as a person standing right before us. I'm giving this lecture on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. The church has put that feast in its calendar because it wants us to realize that the love of God is not something remote, abstract. It's a personal relationship between us and God. And not only one God for the Christian, but a God who is one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A community, a divine community that forms one God. Because those three persons love each other so much that all that belongs to one belongs to the other, and they form a single divinity. That is the kind of love that the Christian must have. And it is shown for us in a very concrete way in the fact that God has sent us his son to become one of us. Jesus Christ is God, the son of God, and yet he is a human being. Just as human as we are, human in every respect except sin. Now, I know some people will say, well, you're not very human if you're not a sinner. It's only human to be a sinner. Well, I think that is a real misunderstanding. What we mean by sin is some tendency or action which is contrary to our nature, which is not the way God intended us to be, which is due to our acceptance of some, something alien to God. It's when we do what is right that we are truly human, not when we sin. It is human to be weak, to be frail, to be tempted, but it is not human to sin. It is inhuman to sin, contrary to our very nature. And so the fact that Jesus and his blessed mother are sinless makes them more human, not less human. And what is especially human about them is that they know how to love. To love both in a divine and in a human way. 
I would ask you in, in your reading of the, of the Old Testament, look at the Psalms and see how often this personal relationship is expressed. Look also to the book of Job. The book of Job is a struggle between God and man. Job cries out to God, why have you allowed these things to happen to me? How can you allow me to suffer when I've been a good person? But it's because he really believes in God that he cries out to him. And in the end, God commends him. God says, Job has spoken rightly about me because, God has, because Job has understood that I am a God who will listen to him, will hear his outcry, even when I can explain to him the plans that I have, because he will not be able to understand them, but he has to trust in me. And that's the way the book of Job ends, in that sense of complete trust in God, even when we don't understand the ways of God. <clears throat> now, the Old Testament there, uh, and one other book of the, of the Old Testament I would recommend to you, and if you haven't looked at it for a long time, perhaps you'll be a little shocked to read it. That is the Song of Songs, or Canticle of Canticles. It's a love song between a man and his bride, and it's a very physical love song. The bridegroom describes the beauty of his bride's body, and she describes the handsomeness of his body in very intimate terms. It's not the kind of thing that Queen Victoria would have read in her court. It's very earthy. Now, the fathers of the church, and the rabbis too, always said there is a deeper meaning to the, to the Psalm of Psalms. It is a celebration of marriage and of love. And in that, it is good. God made man and woman for each other. He made their bodies. He made their souls. And sex in marriage is a noble and beautiful thing, a fruitful thing, a thing that helps people be, to become mature and to build up the whole of society. And yet there is something deeper than that. And the Song of Songs has that deeper meaning. The love of the married couple is a symbol of the love of God for his people. And the scriptural writers could find no way to bring out to us that God loves us in a very intimate way, a way that is as personal as a love between man and woman, except to use this symbol. We find it not only in the Song of Songs, but in many of the prophets. In Ezekiel, for example, God's relation to Israel in the covenant is compared to a marriage. In this case, the wife is unfaithful, but God still loves her forgives her and brings her back. And the same thing is found in the prophet Hosea. And so when we find it in the Song of Songs, we shouldn't be surprised that there is a deeper symbolic meaning. In the New Testament, that appears again in the epistle to the Ephesians, where the love of Christ to his church is compared to the love of man to woman. And the sacrament of marriage itself is a sacrament because it signifies the love of Christ for the church. And so this theme in the scriptures is also something to meditate on and to realize that God's love is not some kind of a vague thing, but is as concrete as a love of a groom for his bride. In the New Testament, this Old Testament idea of love, as 
deep and beautiful as it is, is perfected, brought to its fullness. This is done in many ways. One way is by, in the epistles of St. Paul particularly, where love is praised. I've already mentioned that, but let me just read a little bit more of that famous praise of, of love which St. Paul has. In this, he's trying to, to help the Corinthians understand the love that they need to have in their own community because it was a divided community like many of our congregations and perhaps the whole church is today of people attacking each other and doubting each other's faith. The same thing was happening in the Corinthian community. And St. Paul says, if I speak in human and angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So we must remember then that it's not enough for us to say, well, I'm a believer. I hold, I'm orthodox. I hold the faith of the church. That's necessary. But if that is not also expressed in love for all, our, all of our, the members of the church, even those who may be in error, for our love is not a real love, not just an abstraction, but a real love, our faith really amounts to nothing, as St. Paul says. Another way that and perhaps the most profound way, certainly I would say the most profound way that love is shown in the scriptures is by example. And the example, of course, is first of all the example of Jesus Christ. We have other examples. The example of Paul, for example, who gives his whole life with immense suffering out of love for others and even love for his own people, the Jews, who would not accept uh, Jesus. But Jesus' love is the supreme example, and it is proved for us on the cross. I love to tell the story, the fact, it is historic fact, that 300 years before the time of Christ, the great Greek philosopher Plato raised the question, how can we recognize a truly just person? And he pointed out that it's not enough to look at the person's image because, and Plato knew it very well and we see it in our own times, some of the, the wickedest people in the world know how to create a good image. It's often the sign that a person is a, is a tyrant and a manipulator, that he is able to make people think that he is wonderful, that he is a fine person. So Plato says we can't go on appearances. It may very well be that the person who seems to be the justice person the most righteous person is actually the most wicked because he is using his appearance to manipulate us and to dominate us and to lead us into error. So he says, how then would we know, how would we recognize the truly just man? And you know what Plato said? Plato is a pagan, but I think he had a little bit of the spirit of the prophets here. He says we could only recognize a just man if he was put to death in witness of the truth. And Plato even says put to death by being impaled on a stake, which is the word that the Greeks used for crucifixion. 300 years before the time of Jesus, 
This pagan somehow, because he was a great philosopher, realized that the way to prove love is to die for it. Then when you are humiliated, cast down, rejected, and you continue to love your enemies, then your love is proved. And Jesus himself said, there, no man has greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. And so Jesus' death on the cross is a proof of his love. If he had been a great king who put out very just laws and seemed to be making great improvement in society, some people still could have said, well, he's just doing that for his own aggrandizement, just to make himself powerful. But when he accepted humiliation and death for our sake, then we know that he loves. And personally, I think that is the reason for the crucifixion. Sometimes we think that the point of the crucifixion is to pay the debt of justice owed for our sin. Well, Scripture does sometimes use those expressions of the payment of the debt of justice. But that's only part of the reason. The deeper reason is the proof of Jesus' love for us, the proof of what he taught. And by his proof, remember that what he taught is a witness to God the Father. And so by his death, he proves the love of God for us. You know, some people say, well, if God really loves us, he wouldn't let us suffer. But God in his Son has suffered for us. He is willing to suffer for us. And so we can believe his love. We have proof of his love. And there couldn't be a greater proof. When we read the Sermon on the Mount and the rest of Jesus' teaching on the Christian way of life, we see that he always emphasizes love. And a love which is not restricted like the love of the Old Testament. When he says, love your neighbor, then it's asked, the question is raised, well, who is your neighbor? And then we have the story of the Good Samaritan. Our, good, our neighbor is everybody. Why does the scripture say neighbor? Well, because... We don't have infinite power to do good to other people. And as the old saying used to be, charity begins at home. We have to love those close to us first. That is what's called the order of love. Our family, the people that depend on us, the people we work with, the people who are under our care. We have to love them first. We're the ones who have responsibility for them. But our responsibility doesn't cease there. It extends insofar as it is possible to every last person in the world, including those who have done us the greatest harm, the ones that we most disagree with. Now that's a hard one to accept. I find it hard to accept. And yet, that is what Jesus teaches us. And that is the kind of love he had, a love that extended to praying for his enemies on the cross. It didn't mean that Jesus didn't rebuke his enemies for the evil that they did. We see that he denounces the Pharisees because they are misleading the people. And it's necessary to expose the f f their false teachings and their poor example. But nevertheless, he loved the Pharisees. He commanded the people to obey them. Jesus' love extends to all, and especially in a very special way to his enemies because they need it most. We have to think, though, what love really means. 
I think today we hear the word love used a lot without having any real content to it. The word love is used by a lot of people to mean two things. One, sexual love. You can't use the word love without sex coming into mind. And there's a good reason for that, because the love between man and woman, when it is genuine, permanent, and committed, is certainly one of the deepest kinds of love that is possible. Sometimes they think of the love of parents for child, and that, too, is a very deep and very human love. The second way that the word love is used is a kind of general, and I think rather sentimental attitude of saying, well, I like people. I like people. I don't want anybody to be excluded from uh, friendship. I like them all. Now, that doesn't go very far. It's very easy to see that people talk, who talk in that vein do exclude a lot of people. The people they don't like, they exclude. The people that they like, or at least they don't dislike, they include. They think of love as a kind of attitude of pleasantness. Those two meanings, that love is sex and that it is a sort of general sentimental kindliness, friendliness, is not what we mean by love in the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament, which was written in Greek, chose a word from the Greek language, because there were many words in, you know, there's the old saying, the Greeks had a word for it. The Greek vocabulary was very rich. And they had a number of words for love. But there was one word that wasn't used a lot. It's the word agape, or as sometimes people pronounce it agape. Agape, which means love. But it wasn't a commonly used word. The more commonly used word was eros, from which we get erotic, and which implied a love of desire and would be the appropriate word for uh, sexual love. And there was another word, philia, which meant friendship. And so the New Testament avoids the word for sexual love and the word simply for ordinary friendship or friendliness and picks another word. That alone ought to indicate to us that the Bible has something a little different in mind than what our society has when it speaks of love. That is why the older translations of the Bible use the word charity in order to distinguish it from these other senses of love and to, to translate agape. We don't use charity in the newer translations because it too has lost part of its strength. We think of charity now as giving alms, something to the poor. And that's, that's not what this word means. Uh, it, it includes that, but it is much more than that. So when we use the word love, in, particularly in catechizing or in preaching, or explaining the Bible, we ought to be very careful to explain just what the biblical idea of love is. Agape is, first of all, God's love for us. Now, God is not, has no sexual desire for us, and God is not just friendly to us. God is our creator. God is our Father. God is the one who died for us. I've tried to explain that God's love for us is a very intimate, very personal thing, and it is a total love. 
It's not a love that seeks something. It's a love that tries to give something. The Greek word eros indicates trying to get something. The word agape indicates giving something. And so the love we're talking about, first of all, is God's own love, which is a love of giving. And in fact, that love is the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a person, but a person who is the love between the Father and the Son in the Trinity. Our love is only a reflection of God's love, and we cannot love God in a worthy way except by grace. Our hearts, through sin, our own sin, and the sin of the world in which we live, and the original sin that got the world off the track, through this world of sin, our heart has been hardened. We do not know how to love as God loves. Only the grace of the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts gives us the power to have a love like God's, a love of giving, a love of generosity. And that is what the New Testament is talking about when it talks about love. Now, of course, that love can include the love between man and woman. When the love between man and woman is also a love of God, a sacramental love, then it is included in agape. When the love of parents for their children is a love of their children in God, as gifts of God, then that also is agape. And when our friendliness to other people, our kindliness to others, is a kindliness because we love them as children of God and for the sake of God, and we desire their eternal salvation, then that is New Testament love. Because it is like God's love. It is a lo like the love in the heart of Christ, a love of giving rather than a love of seeking and taking. I wonder how often we think of that fact. When a man says he loves a woman, and he's a Christian, does he stop to think that that love must be a love in God, or it is not real love? It must be Christian love. Christian love includes his desires. It includes erotic love, but it, they must be included and elevated and transcended by the love of God. And so it is for our love for other people. It must be a love in, uh, in God. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, in pondering on these words of Scripture, because his whole theology is just a commentary on the Bible, in pondering on these words of Scripture, tries to figure out just what the word love means. Now here I'm talking about any kind of love, human love, divine love, any kind of love, anything that we can call love. He says has two characteristics to it. One is that we really desire another person's good. Another person's good. If we only desire our own good, and if we only are interested in them and have a relationship with them for our own sake, that's not love at all. We somehow must, we can seek our own good, but we must also seek their good. You can see then how often what people talk about as love in our times and that we see dramatized and TV and the film is really not love at all. A man who desires a woman because she is a sex object does not love her. It's false for him to say he loves her. 
He's not concerned about her at all. He's only concerned about his own pleasure, his own satisfaction. That is not love. It's only when he thinks about what is good for her. And it's not enough to consider her own satisfaction, to say, well, I love her because she wants to have good sex and I give her good sex. That still isn't love. Love has to be a love of the person, the whole person, which means that he has to consider her as a person. He has to consider her whole life. What is he doing to her by this relationship? Is this relationship going to further her life or is it going to put obstacles in the way of her happiness? You've only got to listen a little bit of rock and roll music to see that most of the songs are about people saying they love each other and then deserting each other or cheating on each other. That isn't a story of love at all. It isn't a story of people really loving the other and seeking their good. And the Christian knows that there is no real good for any person which does not lead to eternal life with God. And so we cannot love another person unless we love and seek for them salvation, eternal life. That must be at the heart of every expression of love. We're liars if we say to someone, I love you, and yet are not seeking their salvation. And if we're throwing obstacles in the way of their salvation, it's even a greater lie. But St. Thomas says, although that's a necessary aspect of love, that we seek the other person's good and not just our own, there's a second requirement for it to be real love. And that is that we want to be united with them. We want to share our good, our happiness, with the other person. Now, you know, it's not uncommon that we have a good will towards somebody else. We want them good things for them, and we're willing to do something for them but we would never invite them into our house. We don't want to be with them. We would rather give something for them to get along well away from us, far from us. We give money to the poor, but we wouldn't want to be with them. They're dirty and smelly and we wouldn't want to be with them. Well, that love at least is not Perfect. It may not be a lie, but it is not a, the fullness of Christian love. Christian love looks for union with the other person. And that's true in, in friendship or in, in marriage. It's not just enough to wish the other person well. We want to live with them, to share a common destiny with them. And so it must be for the Christian, and that common destiny must be the journey toward heaven. In heaven, we will be all in one community. We will all be united. We will live with each other forever. And if we don't want to live with each other here on earth, then what's heaven going to be like? It would be hell. And so love then must have those two things. We wish good for the other, and we want that good to bring us closer together in a common good, in a, common, in a, in a community. Christian love, therefore, has these two aspects. We wish the salvation of others, and we wish for them everything that will help them get to their salvation, and we try 
to share what we have with them so they can get to, to their salvation. But we also look forward to forming community with them. We want the union of the church as a community. You know, some people don't care very much for the handshake at Mass. Well, you know, we have different tastes about those things. And sometimes it's ceremony that's not carried out very meaningfully. But the reason it was introduced, and perhaps we want to find some other way to do it, but the reason it was introduced into the liturgy is to try to make clear to people that going to Mass is not a private devotion. It's not just me and the priest. It's the forming of a community. It is forming of the church. The Mass is what forms the church, brings people together. We have to be truly concerned about each other, truly interested in each other. That brings us then to the relation of love to justice, to the last of the cardinal virtues. As faith is connected with prudence, as hope is connected with temperance and fortitude, so love is connected with justice. Today, one of the things that divides the church is the question of social justice. Some people are very concerned about it and so concerned about it that they don't seem to pay any attention to the other aspects of our holy faith. On the other hand, some of the people who talk a great deal about our holy faith don't seem to be terribly interested in justice. Well, we creatures are very one-sided. We emphasize one thing and we neglect the other. St. Thomas says that in trying to avoid one venial sin, we often fall into the opposite venial sin. And perhaps that's true even with regard to more serious sins. We have to have a balance, and the balance, the unity of our life comes from love. So we have to see that the love of God and the love of neighbor are a single commandment. They're not two commandments. In the Old Testament, they're given as two commandments. But in the New Testament, Jesus puts them together and calls them the one great commandment and the commandment that sums up the law and the prophets. Now, the law was about justice. The Ten Commandments are primarily about justice. And the prophets were constantly talking about social justice. So the love of God and the love of neighbor, the, lo the love of God and of neighbor must also be one that is concerned about justice. Love, of course, is greater than justice. In the case of the parable of the Good Samaritan, We can't say that this Samaritan had any very d direct uh, obligation to this man who had been thrown out by the robbers. He could have called 911 and had the police come and get him. But he did much more than that. He went down, got, got him, took him to the inn, took care of his wounds, promised to pay the innkeeper for his keep until the man could go himself. He went beyond justice, and charity goes beyond justice. Love be goes beyond justice. God's love goes far beyond justice. According to justice, we would all be condemned for our sins, but because of the love of God, the mercy of God extends beyond justice 
And the scripture says that God's mercy is greater than his justice. But there cannot be love without justice. A love which is not also justice would be a sentimental love. That's why when we say God is a loving God, it doesn't mean, as some people think, that God will not call us to responsibility and that he will not punish sin. He punishes sin because he loves us, because he is a just God as well as a loving God. And we see that in human society. Someone in charge of a leader in human society who was not concerned about justice as well as charity would be a very poor leader indeed. He would allow crime to go on. He would allow the standards of justice in the society to decline. He would allow all kinds of disorder and people's rights would be taken away. And we can't love them if we don't work to protect their rights. In the New Testament, we are told that the coming of social justice and peace is a sign of the age of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, this is said again and again. When the Messiah comes, when the Messianic age comes, then there will be justice and peace. There will be no poverty. There will be no uh, violence. There will be peace. All will have plenty. I once talked to a rabbi and I asked him, why is it that you don't accept Jesus as Messiah? You believe in Messiah. Jesus was a Jew. He seemed to fulfill all that is said of the Messiah, why don't you accept him? And the rabbi said very earnestly to me, well, there's an old story about that. He says, there was a rabbi in the Middle Ages who was brought before the court. And the courts in those days, the Jews were often persecuted by the government, the Christian government. It was brought before the court. And the court said, why don't you accept the Messiah? Jesus is Messiah. And the Jew said nothing. He walked over to the window and looked out. And the judge said, why don't you answer me? And the man said, well, I'm looking out the window. I see a beggar. I see another man beating up on somebody. I see a prostitute. If Jesus was the Messiah, we would have justice and peace on earth. Now you see, that's the best argument that the Jews have against us. The best argument. If Jesus is the Messiah, why hasn't justice and peace come? Well, the answer, of course, is that with Jesus, the Messianic age began because he did practice peace and justice. He was the just man. He was the man of peace. And not only Jesus himself, but many of his followers. And in the church today, we have many examples of working for justice and peace. Sincere, earnest effort for justice and peace. It's true it is not yet conquered in the world, it requires faith on our part to believe that Christ the King will finally triumph and social just, uh, peace and justice will be brought about. But we have to play our part in bringing it about. The present Holy Father constantly dwells on these two themes. As he goes around the world, he emphasizes that the first thing we must work on for so peace and justice is the family. Justice and peace and the charity and love that we've been talking about, the love of self-giving must grow in the family. 
Only from the family can they penetrate the rest of society. But they must also come to fruition in society. And our love for God must express itself in that effort for justice.